So I thought I would cover the argument by Francesca Fiorentini on capitalism relative to that of the environment. Can we keep capitalism and stop climate change? As I touched upon before, the failure of socialism to the environment, I gave the example of the RLC, the disaster that the Soviet Union caused, redirecting the rivers that fed the RLC. I even gave you the example of the Mexican state-owned oil company that caused a massive spill in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm Francesca Fiorentini, and in this episode, we're looking at the failures of profit-driven climate change solutions, and why the cooking of our planet is becoming a recipe for socialism. Another thing that really frustrates me, of course, and it's a bit off topic, the reason why I was a long-term admirer of Jenna Marbles is because that just really is naturally her personality. You know, she really acts that way and there's something, you know, genuine about herself. Right now, the trends tend to be skewing hard towards the 90s, which is the only type of trend that I am here for. Then you, you see these other YouTubers like that of Nicole Arbor. Time to expose Nicole Arbor. The way that she comes across her persona is just so copied from that of Jenna Marbles. You know, this Francesca Fiorentini, whether she came from a TV background or whatever else, is so irritating, you know? Why can't people just be themselves? Can we have Amazon and the Amazon? What about if the boxes doubled as levies? Please! Anyway, let's just move on. Once again, we've broken global temperature records with July being the hottest month recorded since the invention of recording temperatures. Well, like I've said, uh, she doesn't look at things from a far lengthier time period. We've actually been in a cooling period. We're in a mini ice age. If you were to contrast that to, you know, thousands of years ago, even back to the time of the Roman Empire, the earth was far hotter back then than it ever was today. And you could even look at a period on the planet it when there was no ice there. There was no ice and yet there was no extinction. She mentions about that of the temperature increase. What we can see is where they take their information from. The computer models. The computer models are completely and wholly inaccurate. What we can see is that from what NASA had stated themselves, they mentioned that there was a temperature decline in 2004. Now the reason why that's so important is because it contradicts their narrative with CO2 driving the temperatures. Over the course of 800,000 years, yes, you can see it may seem that way that CO2 has been pretty much level in pattern with that of temperatures, and therefore you might think to yourself, okay, well that must mean that CO2 is driving what the temperatures are. The truth of the matter is, it's actually the temperature that is driving CO2. And the reason for the sharp spike in the CO2 over the past century was actually because of burning all the fossil fuels. The libs never want to talk about the Hadean age when the earth was molten lava. Typical. It's so hot that Greenland is losing ice that wasn't supposed to melt until 2070. The Arctic is on fire, and I'm pretending I belong at random pool parties. What she completely ignores, the Antarctic ice has actually been increasing. Now isn't that convenient? They look at one side of the story, they look at the Arctic, but they don't even bother looking at the Antarctic. So that's why I don't even take these people seriously. So now seems like as good a time as every other moment prior till now to talk about climate change. The planet has already warmed by one degree Celsius since the time we started burning all these fossil fuels. Actually, folk, in one of the most industrialized periods of our history, we saw temperatures decline. Uh, we saw that even post-World War II, when temperatures for four decades would decline. So again, that contradicts this narrative about the rise in temperatures. No, there hasn't. The temperatures have been declining. Maybe in certain years you've seen hotter days and whatnot, but even to look at things from a short graph and a short time period really isn't rational. 
you want to measure temperatures and how things have changed, compare that over millions of years and then we'll see. And we're on track to warm by 4 degrees possibly as soon as 2060. According to the most recent UN study, even 2 degrees of warming would mean millions more refugees, double the loss of food harvest, 10 centimeters of sea level rise, and an obliteration of all coral reefs. And again folk, it's another one of these myths saying that the rise of temperatures results in that of the higher sea levels. In order to get people to take action about climate, climate alarmists like to use imagery which invokes primal fear. The fear of drowning is one of humans' most fundamental instincts, so alarmists create pictures like this one showing Manhattan underwater. There's nothing new about this. Alarmists were doing exactly the same thing in 1934, showing Manhattan underwater as a result of the Arctic melting. April 12, 1934, while melting icebergs engulf the world. And look, there's the Empire State Building underwater. But they wish to push this narrative as usual and scare folk into this narrative. Which means we've got 12 years to have a shot at keeping the temperature to a still bad but manageably terrifying one and a half degrees Celsius of warming. You seriously have to cringe at these people who think that in the grand scale of things, on this planet Earth, that 12 years is really going to make a difference, given the fact that, you know, when you see things like volcanic eruptions take place, you end up seeing more CO2 being emitted into the Earth's atmosphere than that of what you see from mankind, uh, and apparently uh, the CO2 is causing such great damage. <laughs> to believe that, you know, 12 years time we're going to make some manageable difference. These people would make your life misery. So yeah, banning plastic straws ain't gonna cut it. Even though it's fun to watch so-called liberal paper straws trigger our president into doing this. His campaign started selling Trump-themed uh, plastic straws <laughs> so you could buy a pack of 10 for $15. $15 for 10 straws? That's a dollar fifty per straw. People like yourself do not understand a single thing about economics. For example, how many people have I met out there who seem to think that privatization means expensive costs? Private ownership has got absolutely nothing at all to do with cost. What's that got to do with it? You know, that's got nothing at all to do with it. Cost is determined by the laws of supply and demand. So, of course, if you're sitting with paper straws, then there's going to be a shortage of that of those straws. And if there's going to be a greater demand in ratio to what is uh, in supply, then the cost does go up. You would think that would be obvious if you understand prices, but to people like this... <laughs> It is to, I, words cannot even describe just how ignorant people like this are. I mean, why why is it so difficult to find solutions to problems? For example, look at what they're doing in England, where they grind down the plastics and they put it into roads. Why can't we do that and fix all the potholes in the roads? Yeah, isn't that a great idea? Rather than, you know, paper straws. If that's how much Trump thinks straws cost, how much is his dealer charging him for Adderall? Yeah, that'll be uh, $700,000. This person seems to go on about that of the drugs and saying, oh, you know, $700,000, well, maybe if you actually remove the third party payer system, and maybe if you actually remove the government from the healthcare system, and, and maybe if you actually go and study the American Medical Association monopoly, <laughs> maybe then you'll discover that it was your socialist government interventionism through restricting the market and taking away consumer demand in the market, in other words, taking away capitalism, and then monopolising the cost into a third party, and then questioning why you saw a collusion with costs of medicine driving through the roof. I'm not bloody well surprised. That's what happens when you introduce socialism into the economy. <laughs> Part of the reason we're at such a breaking point is thanks to years of shallow solutions. Solutions often devised by the same corporate interests that got us into this mess in the first place. No. 
What got us into this mess today is because people such as yourself thought it was such a great idea to get government involved in the economy. That's precisely, that is 100% the very reason why your economy is in the mess that it's in today. We've got the statistical and historical evidence there that to prove that before the antitrust laws, those so-called companies you accused of holding monopolies did not hold monopolies. They were benefiting the consumers. But because people like you don't know history, and because people like yourself, Francesca Fiorentini, are, you know, stubbornly ignorant of that history, you want to continue on blaming it all on capitalism. And so what do you do? You continue on supporting the very things that led to the rise of all the costs of goods and services soaring through the roof. Because that's what happens. What does the higher price in the market mean? It means a shortage. It means that demand far exceeds that of supply. So how did your government benefit in that matter? It didn't. It just drove people's costs of living through the roof and crippled them. It's the very reason why the American healthcare system today is so morally bankrupt. It's bankrupt because your socialist government interventionism engineered it. One of those solutions is carbon cap and trade, which tries to get polluters to pollute less by limiting the amount of carbon any corporation can emit. Here we come with all of these caps being imposed on industry. If you honestly think that is a solution to such a problem, the inevitable consequence of your silly actions, not only are you going to harm productivity, you, you will harm innovation because you will restrict companies from, you know, not just how much they can produce, you will restrict them from innovation. So they won't be able to innovate the same and technologically improve you know, solutions to actually improving things, right? So that's number one. The second thing, and this is the special point, right? Because you went on about the $700,000 cost. Well, guess what? The higher price is a signal to tell you there's a shortage. The only way that you can create a monopoly is by restricting productive, is by restricting productive output, right? That's it. So, Essentially what you're wanting to do, you want to restrict their productive output. You basically want to drive up their costs of goods and services because that's 100% what that will lead to because you're restricting how much they can produce because you've just basically said you want to set down caps. Now, another thing is that, and you can pretty much see where this is going because this is exactly where it always goes with you socialists because you just don't understand economics. You don't even understand real world solutions to problems. A real world solution to a higher cost is produce more to bring the cost down so that, you know, supply can keep up with demand. That's what you do. However, people such as yourself wish to impose caps. That is to say, price ceilings. And what does that result in? Shortage problems. <laughs> you end up seeing the real cost going through the roof. This is what I mean about people such as yourself, Francesca Fiorentini. You don't even understand basic economics. You see, that sitting over there is what you call basic economics, right? That there, go and read it. Go and get Thomas Sowell's book, Basic Economics, and study it. Hell, even within the first few chapters, it talks about prices and explains this in plain English for you. 